The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a parent discussing his son's school report with his tutor. Listen and fill in the missing information in the report below. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good evening, Mr. Jameson. Please sit down. Uh, good evening. Uh, now, about my son Stephen's report. Yes, just a minute. Yes, now... What class is he in? Oh, yes, 4E. No, 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 4A, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Has he improved this year, Mrs Hargreaves? Yes, I think overall, yes. Mind you, there is still room for more improvement in some subjects. Let's see. Maths. Well, the major problem here seems to be his algebra. Apart from that, he's doing much better. Could you help him with this, Mr. Jameson? Well, to be honest, it wasn't really my best subject at school either. But the overall exam result was encouraging. 60%. Yes, and history, I seem to remember a bad report for this last year. Well, he lacks concentration in the class, and of course this makes it difficult to remember things like dates and names, and a memory is quite useful in a subject like this. Oh dear. Well, I'll have a word with him when I get home and see what we can do to improve that. And music. Music, yes. Is he still having guitar lessons? Yes, every Monday after school. His music teacher has commented that he doesn't seem to be taking them very seriously. I think it was just a craze he had, Mrs Hargreaves. I've noticed that he hasn't been very interested in practising at home. And also, he tends to talk a lot in class. I mean, he's very talkative. And he only got 40% in the exam. Well, nobody in our family is very musical, so I don't expect him to do very well. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Looking at his geography result, though, there has been considerable improvement, 64%. Yes, I remember him working at home a lot for some sort of project or something on... Uh, now, where was it? India, I think. No, uh, on China. Yes, yes. And it was an excellent piece of work. I saw it myself and was very impressed. And his art classes have also been going better this year. Yes, he became very interested in pop art after the school and went to the local art gallery to see the pictures there. His bedroom wall is covered with posters from the shop. Yes, and 58% is not bad for his exam result, considering how low it was last year. And now French. It seems that he has really taken to speaking a foreign language. We hoped he would, because it's important to know another language these days, isn't it? Yes, quite. That's why we paid for him to go to France last Easter, so he could practice more. Well, it seems to have done the trick. 80% is a very good mark. Now, Mrs Hargreaves, I'd just like to ask you one more thing about...
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk on cultural shock. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Hi, congratulations on finishing orientation for our study abroad program. Before you all head off to your respective countries, however, I want to first share with you a little bit about dealing with culture shock. Recent studies in intercultural experience have shown that there are distinct phases of adjustment which virtually everyone who lives abroad goes through. You won't be the exception. The first phase of culture shock includes gaining an awareness of the host culture, preparing for the journey, and farewell activities. You're all experiencing this right now. The second phase begins when you arrive in your new country and ends when the excitement of the early experiences wear off. When you first get there, you will be overwhelmed. Initial impressions convey a sense of monumentality of the experience. You'll love it. During the third phase, you will start taking a more active role in your setting. This will produce frustration because there will be some difficulty in coping with even the most elementary aspects of everyday life. I remember not being able to find a toilet one day because I forgot the word for bathroom. Anyhow, your focus will shift during this phase to the differences between your new host culture and your home cultures. This can be troubling. But these sometimes insignificant difficulties can be blown into major catastrophes. That's why the stage is most often referred to as culture shock. Now look at questions seventeen to twenty. As the talk continues, answer questions seventeen to twenty. But relax. When this stage is over, you will slip into the gradual adjustment stage. You may not even be aware that this is happening. You will just begin to orient yourself and to interpret subtle cultural clues. The culture will become familiar to you, and you'll start to feel at home. The next phase will be your discovery that you have the ability to function in two cultures. With full confidence, and you may even feel completely integrated into your new host culture. In this phase, you will also start to have a sense of shared fate concerning events abroad. The last stage is the re-entry phase when you return home. This can be for some the most painful phase of all. You will be excited about sharing your experiences, but you will realise that you have changed and won't be able to explain how or why. One set of values has already been instilled in you; another you will have acquired in your host country. Both may seem equally valid. It is important that you realise that all of these phases are a natural part of adapting to a new culture. Expect peaks and valleys during your stay, and feel free to discuss your feelings with the resident director. These culture shock phases tend to occur even with relatively short stays abroad. During your stay. If you feel a wave of bewilderment wash over you, remember this little talk and look back at your notes. One very typical reaction against culture shock is the tendency to hang out with other Americans. Remember, you are coming to a foreign country 
to get to know her people, language and culture better. If you avoid contacts with the foreign language, you cheat yourself and lengthen the process of adaptation. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between students Maria and Jack. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about their opinions about some of the things in their universities. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Two four one four double three one. Good afternoon. May I speak to Jack Robert, please? Speaking, please. Hi, Jack. This is Maria. Hello, Maria. How are you getting on there? Fine. I arrived in Nottingham yesterday. I've just settled down and I live on the campus of Nottingham University. Oh, that's good. Do you like the campus? Yes, it's beautiful. What do you think of yours? Edinburgh University? It's marvellous. It's on a hill and very close to the sea. I like it very much. It sounds beautiful. Jack, what's the weather like there? Oh, it's fine and sunny. It's said that the weather here is very nice in summer, but awful in winter. What's the weather like in Nottingham? Well, it's a bit depressing. It's been raining since yesterday. I can't go out, so I have to stay in my room. What about your room? Is it a nice one? Yes, it's small and elegant. How about yours? Mine is an ordinary one. It's a twin study room. I share it with one of my classmates. He's intelligent and very friendly. We're getting on quite well. How's your roommate? She's very nice, but a little bit quiet. She likes reading and seldom speaks. By the way, do you like the Scottish food there? Oh, I like it. It's very delicious. Oh, really? I don't like the food here. It's disgusting. It has no taste. I have to cook for myself in my room. Well, Maria, as the saying goes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Come on, don't be too choosy. Oh, someone's at the door. I have to answer it, Maria. I'll call you this evening. Bye. Bye. Ellen, a student union officer, is conducting a survey about the university facilities. She is asking two students about their opinions. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm Alan and I work for the Student Union. Now, I'd like to hear your opinions about a few things in the university. We've asked for some volunteers to help us conduct this survey into how satisfied students are with the university facilities. First of all, let's take the lecture rooms. 
We could score them, for instance, 1 is excellent, 2 satisfactory, 3 rather poor, and 4 really bad. Robert, you first, please. What do you think about the lecture rooms here? Not so good, I'm afraid. I would score 3. They're too small for one thing. Sometimes we can hardly find a seat. Yes, but that doesn't happen very often. Personally, I think they're all right. They're comfortable, and the acoustics are quite reasonable. It doesn't matter where you sit, you can always hear the lecture. I would give two for them. How do you feel about the car parking facilities? Are they adequate? You must be joking. I can never find a car parking space when I need one, and when I finally do, it's a very long walk to the university's teaching building. I'd give it a four. I'm afraid I also agree. We need more car parks urgently. This is perhaps one of the major shortcomings of this campus. It gets a four from me as well. I come to the university 20 minutes early, just so I can drive around looking for a parking space. What about the computer centre then? I think it's first class. The software base contains a large selection of learning programmes, language games and word processing facilities. I would give a score of one. I quite agree with you. It's very modern and also under the supervision of qualified staff who can offer help to us while we work, should we need them. Oh, good. Well, what do you think of the library facilities? Let's say the periodical room first. Well, I've scored that three. I'm sorry to have to say, but, er, uh, I think the room has poor lighting and I'm disappointed about that. I've given it a score of one. As far as I'm concerned, it's excellent and well stocked. Thank you, Robert and Mary. Now, let's turn to the photocopying facilities. Hmm, I would give it a score of two. Personally, I think it's all right and it's very helpful. Huh? I would score three. I think it's too expensive for photocopying and there are not enough machines. Sometimes we have to stand in a line. OK. Now, let's talk about the... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a presentation by a second-year environmental studies student on research into edible vaccines. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I've chosen to give my seminar presentation on a very interesting piece of appropriate technology designed to prevent sheep and goats from contracting a particularly virulent disease called Goat's Plague, which is a big problem across large parts of Africa, the Middle East and South Asia. The Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore has been working to produce genetically modified peanut plants to deliver an edible vaccine, in other words, vaccine which is given through the medium of food. In this case, it is given through genetically modified peanut leaves, which are often used as animal fodder in India. Why is edible vaccine considered much better suited to the local conditions and needs than ordinary vaccines injected by needles? Well, firstly, injected versions are very expensive to produce, whereas edible ones are cheap, which must surely be one of the most important plus factors when choosing a mode of delivery. Secondly, a big drawback with injected vaccines is that they easily perish when they are not kept cool. By contrast, there are far fewer problems with storing edible vaccines. They can last a long time outside a fridge. You can imagine that in remote rural areas, that is an enormous benefit. 
Another advantage is, because this edible vaccine only contains one viral protein, it allows vets easily to pick out which animals are infected. It's apparently a common problem with injected vaccine that vets can't distinguish between sick and vaccinated animals. However, edible vaccines do have their drawbacks. The major problem is ensuring that exactly the right dose is delivered. The amounts of vaccine which develop in a given genetically modified plant differ significantly depending on the growing conditions. Obviously, too little of the protein might leave certain animals insufficiently protected. And there is also another shortcoming related to the issue of dosage of these vaccines. 99% of the protein actually perishes in the sheep or goat's stomach. We therefore cannot be sure just how much is getting through and working to protect the animal. These negative aspects really have to be addressed to ensure that animals receive maximum benefit. And finally, as with all GM crops, the transgenic peanut plants will have to be grown under strict supervision if we are to ensure that it does not contaminate peanuts grown for human consumption. Now, moving on to the next part of my seminar presentation. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.